Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and I'm going to take you from the first vision to Carthage Gel in less than an hour. I'm going to take you all the way through the chronological order of church history. But there's two things I'm not going to do and then one thing I'm hoping to do. The first thing I'm not going to do is read to you line by line what happened to who and to when and where and go through it chronologically like that. That would be a very boring hour. The second thing I'm not going to do is be comprehensive. By doing this in less than an hour, it's going to be impossible for me to teach all the stories and, uh, and the doctrines and everything else that are found within church history. But the one thing that I am going to try to do is tell stories of the people who are actually there, share with you their testimonies, and by so doing, I'll take you chronologically from the first vision to Carthage Jail and be able to put things into perspective of, of where things happened and when things happened and why they happened clear up some of the questions that a lot of people have, such as, what's the difference between Liberty Jail and Carthage Jail? What happened in Missouri that got the Missourians so upset and drove the saints out? And where was Joseph during all that time? Other questions like, how did Joseph get to Kirtland? What, what in the world took him there? Things like this that I'll hopefully uh, put together in a nice, easy storytelling way so that in less than an hour, you'll be able to see church history from start to finish and get a good sense and idea of, uh, of the wonderfulness that it is. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We all know that the first vision started in, or it happened in 1820, but the story actually begins a little bit before then. In the summer of 1819 is when the re revivalists come to Palmyra and start to preach about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Joseph, he went to the different churches and congregations and he started to hear about the different things and different interpretations of the same scripture found in the Bible that it started to cause a lot of confusion in his life. Well, Joseph was not only confused by this, but he was also confused at how the different ministers were competing, as it seemed to his mind, for different converts to join their churches. This didn't seem like a Christ-like way to do things. In the summer of 1819, according to the William Smith's journal, about 150 different preachers came to Palmyra. Now, we would call this a, uh, a convention or a trade show. They called it a fair, where each preacher lined up in their, in their booths up and down the street, and people could go from booth to booth hearing the different preacher. Well, Joseph was attracted to one particular preacher that he went to day after day, William says, and that preacher had one message. If you want to know which church to join, just pray and ask God, and he'll tell you to join my church. Well, that preacher had half of, his, half of his sermon was correct. The basis of his sermon was James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Joseph clinged to that message. And it was through those summer months, the fall and the winter months, that Joseph would repeatedly think and ponder about James 1.5. He was preparing to receive an answer. In his history, he says, I pondered on it again and again, knowing that if any man needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. And so he understood that if God could answer prayer, that was the source of truth. He couldn't get truth any other place, although he had looked for it. Finally, the spring came. And on a beautiful spring morning in the year 1820, Joseph went into the grove behind his home. Joseph knew exactly where to go and what to do because he had good parents who taught him how to pray. They went into the grove and that's where they had their family home evening. It's where they'd read scriptures, have family prayer um, when the weather was right. So Joseph knew that it was into the grove that he should go and pray, which he did. And as he started to pray and search for the answer to his questions, he said in his own words, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun which descended gradually until it rested upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved Son, hear him. In answer to Joseph's prayer, God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to young Joseph. They called him to be a prophet, and through Joseph, Jesus Christ would restore his church back to the earth. Well, after that extraordinary experience, Joseph went back into the house. He was pondering, meditating on this event that just took place. He was leaning on the mantle of the fireplace, and his mom noticed that something was, was occupying his mind. She inquired, and Joseph replied, All is well, mother. Nothing is the matter. And then he says, 
I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. What a profound statement. And if we break it apart, I have learned for myself, and second, that Presbyterianism isn't true. First, I have learned for myself. For almost two years, Joseph had been inquiring about truth and and uh, the Bible and salvation and which church to join. And during those two years, he had listened to his parents, his friends, his fa family members, uh, now the ministers, and he couldn't find the truth until he went and sought for himself by pleading to Heavenly Father for an answer to his prayer. And then the second part to his question, or to his statement, he had learned that Presbyterianism wasn't true. His mother was a Presbyterian, a Presbyterian, and she had studied the Bible for about 20 years and concluded that the Presbyterian church came closest to the truth that she was looking for. And so that's why she united with them. Well, that's pretty bold for a 14-year-old to tell his mother, after 20 years of searching, Mom, I think you got it wrong. But she didn't doubt him, not even for a minute. That shows the character of Joseph and how trustworthy he was. Well, three years would pass without any further communication. Joseph was praying one night, uh, asking for forgiveness of sin, thinking that maybe he wasn't, didn't have a good standing with his Heavenly Father, and that's why communication hadn't continued. And it was on that night, September 21st, 1823, that the angel Moroni appeared. When Moroni appeared at his bedside, he tells him six things. Your name is, uh, he calls him by name. Your name is Joseph. He says, my name is Moroni. I've been sent from the presence of God. The Lord has an important work for you to do, Joseph. Your name is going to be had for good and evil throughout the entire world because of the work that you're going to be involved in. There, in a nearby hill is deposited a record and, which contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants of this continent. And then for the rest of the night, Moroni talks about the temple and the second coming. Almost as if he teaches the Book of Mormon, the temple, and the second coming. Very similar to the very things that President Nelson continues to repeat to us today. This experience happens three times through the night. The next morning, Joseph goes out to go work in the field with his older brothers and his dad. His dad, sensing that something wasn't right, sent Joseph home, thinking that he wasn't feeling well. Joseph, trying to cross over the fence and head across the field back to his home, he was exhausted, having been up all night, that he fell on his face. The next thing he can recollect is his name being called, Joseph, Joseph. He looks up. It's the same Angel Moroni calling his name again. Angel Moroni asks him, why didn't you tell your dad? Joseph admits, I, don't, I didn't think my dad would believe me. Moroni says, go back and tell your dad about the experience you had last night. He'll believe you. He went and talked to his dad. He told him everything that happened the night before. Joseph Sr.'s response, it is of God. Go and do as commanded. Joseph Sr. had a testimony that his son was the prophet of the restoration. Joseph left the field. He walked the three miles to the hill Cumorah. Owing to the distinctness of the vision, he knew exactly where the, the record would be found. He pried open the box, and there it was, the record. He reached in and tried to get it. It wasn't happening. He got shocked. He reached in again, got shocked again. Reached in a third time, and he got shocked so hard that it threw him off his feet and onto his back. And then the angel Moroni appeared. Joseph says, why can I not obtain the plate? Moroni says, you have not been diligent in keeping the commandments of the Lord. And thus began the training of the future prophet. The next year, a whole year would go by. September 21st again would come and Joseph would return to the hill. He'd open up the box. He'd look in, there were the plates. He went to reach for the plates. No shock this time, but he, set, he pulled the plates out and he sets them on the ground next to him. He goes in for the other artifacts, and when he turns around, the plates are gone. He scrambles around searching for them. Eventually, Moroni appears and says, Joseph, what, what's the problem? And he says, I can't find the plates. And he says, you took your eyes off the plates, and that was against the rules. You're going to have to come back and try this again the third year. Joseph returns again. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing. Joseph returns the third year. We don't know too much about what happens. Joseph doesn't record about his interaction there with the plates and with Moroni. We do know that he did not ob obtain them, but he did ask Moroni before th that day concluded. J he asked Moroni, when will I be able to obtain the plates? Moroni says, if you're obedient and faithful to the commandments that the Lord's given you, you will be able to obtain the plates a year from now. And you also got to bring the right person with you. If you don't do these things, Joseph, you'll be cut off forever. Well, Joseph descended the hill and went back home not knowing who the right person was. Now, Joseph's family was poor. They didn't have much money at all, and so they had to go out and, and work odd jobs. Joseph was hired by a man by the name of Josiah Stoll out of Colesville, New York. 
he went down to Colesville, New York, and he was working for, for Josiah Stoll. And while working there, he was room and boarding with a man by the name of Isaac Hale, who lived just across the border into Pennsylvania, a little sleepy town called Harmony, Pennsylvania. Isaac Hale had a beautiful daughter by the name of Emma. Joseph and Emma met in this circumstance. They fell in love. Isaac didn't like Joseph, and so Joseph and Emma had to elope and move in with Joseph's parents back in Palmyra. Emma accompanied Joseph back to the home where she lived with him. Now as newlyweds, September 21st rolls around again. Joseph descends the stairs and walks out the front door about midnight. This is according to Mother Smith's history. She doesn't think much of it. But then uh, Emma follows soon after Joseph, and then Mother Smith says, I knew exactly what they were doing. They went to the hill, Camorra, they obtained the plates. Now remember Moroni's commandment? You can have the plates if you bring the right person. Who's the right person? Emma. According to fact, Joseph could not have been the prophet of the restoration and done the things which he did without Emma faithfully, faithfully standing by his side. Well, they now have the plates. Persecution starts to arise in Palmyra, so much so that they've got to get out of town. They have no place to go. Emma writes a letter to her dad and says, we have persecution up here. We need a place to stay. Luckily, Isaac and Joseph had at least one thing in common, and that was that they both loved Emma. So, of course, Isaac Hell, the father of Emma, invites them down to Harmony where they live. While there, Joseph was able to secure from his father-in-law uh, the neighboring parcel of land, 13 acres, which had a home on it. Emma and Joseph moved in. They started to farm. Fortunately, Emma gave birth to a child that only lived for a few hours. The translation of the Book of Mormon was going very slowly. Uh, he, uh, having a scribe was unreliable at, at, at best, and Joseph was trying to comfort his mourning wife who uh, just buried their first child. He was trying to farm, and Emma's parents and, and uh, extended family didn't like him either. So the work on the translation of the Book of Mormon was progressing very slowly. Joseph prayed for a scribe, and, it, and his prayer was answered. A man by the name of Oliver Cowdery was seeking work. He was a school teacher. He went into Palmyra to, be, to look for a job. The school superintendent happened to be Hiram Smith. Hiram hired uh, Oliver, and as was customary in those days, Oliver moves in and rooms and boards with, the, with uh, some of his students, with, with the family of some of his students. Some of his students happened to be Joseph's younger brothers and sisters, so now Oliver's living at, at the Smith family farm with the Smith family. Well, he starts to hear rumors about Joseph Smith around town. He asks the family about it. Family doesn't want to talk about it. It brings persecution. Finally, he gains the confidence and trust of Father Smith, and he asks, what are these stories about your son? Joseph Sr. confides in him all the stories about the restoration that had taken place up to this point. Oliver kneels and prays and asks God if it's true. He gets a testimony that it is true, and he, in the accompaniment of Samuel Smith, the younger brother of Joseph, they walk together 145 miles down to Harmony, Pennsylvania, where Oliver is introduced to Joseph Smith. That happened on April 5th. April 7th, they get to work, full-time translating of the Book of Mormon. They're going through it, and they come to a part, we assume, 3 Nephi 11, where the Savior talks about baptism and priesthood authority uh, that's needed for baptism. And Joseph looks at Oliver and says something to the effect of, Joseph or Oliver, have you ever been baptized? Oliver responds, no, at least not the way the Savior's describing baptism here. Joseph says we must pray about it. So they did. They went into a nearby grove of trees there on Joseph's property in Harmony. They knelt down and prayed. And in response to that inquiry about baptism and priesthood authority, John the Baptist appeared. He conferred upon them the Aaronic priesthood, and it's recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 13, the words that he says, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels and the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again unto the Lord in righteousness. Well, Joseph and Oliver were then commanded to baptize each other in the Susquehanna River and then reordain each other to the Aaronic priesthood. I want to share with you something that President Nelson has said about priesthood authority and all of our connection as members of the church to Harmony, Pennsylvania. In President Nelson's uh, first 
priesthood session of conference after being sustained as prophet and president of the church. He gave a talk, and in that talk, he talked about setting apart. He told the bishopric members and the state presidency members that when they set people apart, set them apart with power and authority. I'll give you a couple of other quotes from him. That power and authority, obviously, and of course, being priesthood, power and authority being given. President Nelson says, We see faithful women who understand the power inherited in their callings and in the endowments and other or temple ordinances. These women know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen their husbands, their children, and others they love. These are spiritually strong women who lead, teach, and minister fearlessly in their callings with the power and authority of God. How thankful I am for them. In another conference session, he says, now, may I clarify some additional points with respect to women in priesthood. When you are set apart to serve in a calling under the direction of one who holds priesthood keys, such as your bishop or stake president, you are given priesthood authority to function in that calling. When we think of harmony and the restoration of the priesthood, I hope all of us as members of the church, regardless of our calling, regardless of our gender, regardless of any other characteristic, that we all have a special connection to that sacred um, restoration of the priesthood that happened there in harmony. One other thing, or several, there's several things that happened in harmony, but one other thing that I'll mention, Doctrine and Covenants section four was received in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Now we've got the priesthood restored. Now we've got instruction on, on how to perform our church callings with priesthood power and authority. In part, section four says, instructing us how to perform our, or magnify our, our church callings. Have faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God. And that's how you're qualified for the work. Moroni would clarify some things further for us, and I'll connect all these dots in just a moment. Moroni, chapter 7, verse 33. And Christ hath said, If you will have faith in me, you shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. So here we have priesthood power and authority restored. We have our church call. This is modern, modern times here that we're talking about, Latter-day Saints. We have the priesthood power and authority restored. Each of us have been given a responsibility in the kingdom of God and building it up through our different church callings. And now DNC 4, Happened in Harmony, says, If you have faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God, you'll be able to do a marvelous work and glory, a marvelous work and wonder with that calling that you've been entrusted with. And how's it all possible? Well, if we have the faith, then we get the power, is what the Savior says, as quoted by Moroni in the Book of Mormon. So many wonderful things happened in harmony. But we're moving on. They can't stay in harmony too long because of persecution. They don't know where to go. They can't go back to Palmyra. Well, Oliver has a, a friend who's living in Fayette, New York, by the name of David Whitmer. They write a letter to David Whitmer and say, hey, we're having a lot of persecution down here, but the things we're involved in, they're of God and they're true. Can we come to your family's farm and finish the work? Through a couple of miraculous stories, it ends up that Joseph and Oliver and Emma are invited to the Whitmer Farm in Fayette, New York. They go there. They finish the. They complete the translation of the Book of Mormon there in Fayette. A couple of other notable things that happened in Fayette: the three witnesses had their experience there, where they saw the angel and the plates. They heard the voice of Jesus Christ telling them, commanding them to be faithful and diligent to the testimony that they have of the Book of Mormon, which they were the rest of their lives. Also on April 6, 1830, in Fayette at the Whitmer Farm, the church was officially organized. During that meeting, Joseph and Oliver were sustained as teachers of the in the church, elders, first and second elder. They also had the sacrament, and Joseph taught. He preached the gospel, and he taught doctrine. Many people were baptized soon after that first uh, church meeting. Also there at the Whitmer Farm, uh, uh, the first two general conferences were held. Well, as, as, uh, as the church is now officially organized, we've got priesthood power and authority. The Book of Mormon is now translated. It's time to call missionaries and gather Israel. Joseph does just that. He calls uh, Samuel Smith, heads east on, on, the, on a mission, preaching the Book of Mormon. But the, uh, the story that we're going to follow is of four missionaries who were sent together. Oliver Cowdery, uh, excuse me, Oliver Cowdery, uh, Peter Whitmer Jr., P, uh, Parley P. Pratt, and uh, Ziba Peterson were all called to fulfill the Book of Mormon prophecy that the, tr that the gospel would be preached to the Lamanites. Well, at that time, Joseph defined the Lamanites as being the American Indians. So the American Indians had just been removed from the United States 
unjustly, of course, and wrongly, but they were, through the Indian Removal Act, they were sent out to the Kansas Territory. Well, to get from Fayette, New York, to, Can to the Kansas Territory, they followed along a trail called the Chillicothe Trail. The Chillicothe Trail took them right through the hometown of Parley P. Pratt, one of those four missionaries. Parley P. Pratt says, hey, Let's stop over, we'll rest, and we'll preach the gospel to my friends and family. One of his friends was a, a Campbellite minister by the name of Sidney Rigdon. Parley goes to Sidney, says, Sidney, there's been a restoration, read this book. Sidney says, no, I don't think it's for me. Parley says, may we preach to your congregation? He says, sure, Parley, you could do that. Parley and his companions preached about the restored gospel and the, their testimony of the Book of Mormon to Sidney Rigdon's congregation. Many people in the congregation believed their words and desired baptism. Sidney Rigdon said, well, maybe I need to look into this. Let me have a look at that book again. It wasn't long until Sidney gained his testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ as well, as it was restored through the prophet Joseph. The missionaries started to have a wonderful success in Kirtland. In fact, there were more saints in Kirtland at this time than there were in all of New York. Sidney Rigdon and also newly baptized Edward Partridge decided that they wanted to go to Fayette and meet the prophet, which they did. While there, Joseph and Sidney Rigdon had an instant bond and connection, a connection of trust and friendship. Sidney says to Joseph, Joseph, over in Kirtland area, we have more members of the church than you have here in New York, and we don't have any of the persecution. Why don't you come over to Kirtland and uh, help establish the church there? Joseph thinks on that for a while, and of course, he goes to the Lord and asks the Lord what he should do. In response to that prayer, he receives section 38. Go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. Here the Lord is starting to introduce again what Moroni first talked about, and that is the temple. Joseph, go to the Ohio, and there I will give you my law and endow you with power from on high. Well, Joseph and Emma, they get in a horse-drawn sleigh, and on February 4th, 1831, they pull up in front of the Newell K. Whitney store. Newell K. Whitney and his wife, Elizabeth Ann Whitney, had been seeking for truth, and they had been desiring to unite with a congregation where they could find salvation in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. One night they were praying for the truth, and this is what happened. Elizabeth Ann Whitney says, It was midnight. My husband and I were in our house at Kirtland praying for the Father to be shown the way when the Spirit rested upon us and a cloud overshadowed the house. It was as though we were out of doors. The house passed away from our vision. We were not conscious of anything but the presence of the Spirit and the cloud that was over us. We were wrapped in a cloud. A solemn awe pervaded us. We saw the cloud and felt the Spirit of the Lord. Then we heard a voice out of the cloud saying, Prepare to receive the work of the Lord, for it is coming. At this we marveled greatly, but from that moment we knew that the word of the Lord was coming to Kirtland. And shortly after, Joseph did arrive, February 1831. Well, while in Kirtland, so many things happened. President Hinckley, when he dedicated the sites out there not long ago, he in that dedicatory prayer, he said, he said uh, in no other place has the Savior appeared to so many, and so many wonderful manifestations have taken place. Sixty-four recorded sections in the Doctrine and Covenants were received there. The Father and Son appeared together four, at least four times, and the Savior appearing a recorded 18 or more times. The things that happened in Kirtland were sacred, and they were wonderful. The church was really starting to blossom. Converts were coming to Kirtland. The church was growing. Kirtland was an area of first. They had, of course, the first temple, but also the first in organizations, the first first presidency, the first quorum of the twelve, the first quorum of the seventy, the first bishop, the first bishop storehouse, the first missionary training center. All of these things that were starting to get established and put in place for the future growth of the church was happening. Well, uh, uh, of all the things that I'd love to share with you about Kirtland, let me focus solely on the temple. Joseph was commanded to build the temple. He didn't know what a temple was. He didn't know what it looked like. Uh, and so he gathered some, some of the brethren together, and he said, Brethren, we've been commanded to build a temple. Counsel me. What do we do? How do we build a temple? It, one man suggested, Let's build, we know how to build log homes. Let's build a big log home that's really nice. 
somebody tried to outdo him a little bit and said, you know, we can do better than that. We know how to build frame homes, a nice frame home. In fact, we can even make it a two story <clears throat> and it will be really nice, Joseph. Joseph, in somewhat frustration, dismissed the meeting uh, because that wasn't the answer he was looking for. But before he dismissed it, he told the brethren, he said, brethren, you don't understand. We are building a temple to God, not a house of man. Well, he gathered his first presidency together, Frederick G. Williams, second counselor, Sidney Reagan, his first counselor, and they were meeting in their upstairs uh, office there in the Newell K. Whitney store, and they were praying, what's this temple supposed to be? That's when the vision opened. Frederick G. Williams in his journal says that he saw the vision. Well, they all saw the vision. They saw the temple out the window on the hill where it stands even today. He said that in an instant they were taken to the temple where they were able to study and look outside. The eyes of their understanding were open so that they understood the height, the dimension, the materials. And then all of a sudden the temple lifted up and came on top of them and they were now inside. They knew exactly what it looked like. <clears throat> Everything was recorded perfectly in their minds and they knew just what the temple was to be. Joseph brings the brethren back together. He says, this is how the temple is supposed to be, brethren. Everybody was kind of looking at each other. You may have heard the little crickets chirping because nobody knew how to build it. Such a marvelous and, and magnificent building. Until finally, Lorenzo Young says, Joseph, I know somebody who can build this building for us. His name's Artemis Millet. He lives up in Canada. Joseph, without any hesitation, looks at Brigham. He says, Brigham, I give you a mission. You're to go to Canada. Find this Artemis Millet. Preach him the gospel and baptize him. Bring him to Kirtland so he can help us build this temple. And then almost as an afterthought, he says, Oh, Brigham, one more thing. Tell Artemis to sell everything he has and to bring $1,000 and donate it to the, to the construction fund of the temple. Brigham Young, without a, a moment of hesitation, said, You got it, Joseph. He walked to Canada, found Artemis Millet, preached him the gospel, baptized him, helped him sell all of his belongings, and escorted him back to Kirtland. Artemis Millet donated the $1,000, and he helped uh, the saints build the, the Kirtland Temple. And what a blessing. What a marvelous miracle it was that we were able to get Artemis Millet, the man who knew how to build the temple, to Kirtland so that the temple could be erected. Now, why is that such a wonderful thing for us today? Well, because the Savior appeared in the Kirtland Temple. In addition to the Savior appearing, three ancient prophets appeared, bestowing upon Joseph and Oliver keys, priesthood keys that direct the work uh, that officiates the blessings of the work that we all enjoy as members of the church today. So what a great, great uh, blessing it is that Joseph had the audacity to be so bold enough to tell Brigham to go and find Artemis. And what a blessing it is that Brigham had the faith that with all things with with God all things are possible and he went immediately to Canada and brought Artemis Millet so that we could enjoy the blessings of the restored gospel today day of dedication comes anybody who had anything to do with the temple and even the curiosity people people with curiosity of the temple wanted to be there on the day of dedication the place was jam packed thank heaven they didn't have a fire marshal that was checking things out that day because they were well over capacity but they were all there and thrilled with excitement. They sang the Spirit of God. Wonderful spiritual manifestations were made that day where people saw angels. They heard angelic uh, heavenly voices singing with the choir. And uh, the, dedica the, the dedicatory prayer was offered, which is now found as section 109 in the Doctrine and Covenants. That meeting lasted eight hours and it was wonderful. Nobody dared leave because they didn't want to lose their seat. But they stayed and it was, a, it was a great meeting as reported by all. In fact, so great that Joseph decided to repeat the dedication a few days later for those who weren't able to attend. Well, we now have the dedication of the temple. Priesthood keys had been restored there in, in, the, in that temple. And now we've got somewhat of a full functioning, organized church ready to roll forth. Do you remember our four missionaries that came and helped preach, not settle, but they helped come and, and preach in Kirtland and, uh, and got this church really started going uh, in that area? Well, they continued on their mission down into the Kansas Territory. When they were in the Kansas Territory preaching to the Native Americans, local preachers in Missouri got wind of what was going on. And they said, hold on a second, you've got to have a permit to preach to the Indians 
So they, they uh, complained to the U.S. government. The U.S. government came out and said, yeah, you got to have permit. we got to do this the right way. The missionary said, we didn't know that. You know, we want to do it the right way, so we'll jump back into America, into Missouri, and we'll preach the gospel here to the local Missourians. Well, it was at that time, or it's time about, it was about that time that the Lord reveals where these missionaries were down there in Missouri, that this would be Zion, a future gathering place. As recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 57, verses 1 through 3, Hearken, O ye elders of my church, saith the Lord your God, who have assembled yourselves together according to my commandments, in this land, which is the land of Missouri, which is the land which I have appointed and consecrated for the gathering of the saints. Wherefore, this is the land of promise and the place of, of excuse me, and the place for the city of Zion. And thus saith the Lord your God, If ye will receive wisdom, here is wisdom. Behold, the place which is now called Independence is the center place, and a spot for the temple is lying westward upon the lot, which is not far from the courthouse. This is going to be a gathering place. So Joseph sent more missionaries. He sent converts there. He relocated the entire branch that's in Colesville, New York, to go march all the way down and settle in Independence, Missouri. So we now have two bodies of saints. The Kirtland Saints, where Joseph is presiding, and we've got the Missouri Saints, where Oliver is down there presiding. And we've got the two bodies of saints um, uh, in, in two different locations now. So you got to understand that the Kirtland story and the Missouri story happen simultaneously. So everything I've been talking about with re restoration of priesthood keys and the Kirtland Temple and some of the stories and things that happen in Kirtland, the Missouri story is happening at the same time. So let me tell you the Missouri story, and then we'll bring the body of saints together, and then we'll continue on moving moving forward. So we know some things about um, Missouri. That the Missourians didn't like the saints, and they pushed them out, they persecuted them, and bad things happened. Let me rewind all that and give you some background information. As more and more saints started to come in and settle into independence, the locals, the natives, started to get a little restless, not knowing what exactly is going on? We've got a lot of people moving in, and the Missourians start to see several things that they don't like about the members of the church, these new immigrants. Um, I've identified six. There might be more. There might be less. But here are some things, not to excuse the acts of the Missourians, but to give you an idea of why the two uh, cultures of people uh, didn't get along right away or ever. Um, and some of those issues are these religious of course we were bringing in a new religion the missourians didn't have much of a religion at all culture is a different thing these folks were from england new england and coming out to kind of the wild wild west another thing was economics the people in missouri were doing pretty good they were there at the head of the santa fe trail where the fur trappers and anybody heading west were going and making the last pit stop and buying goods and services before heading west and now the saints are coming in kind of on that economic territory Worse for the Missourians is that the saints started working together. I'll make the candles, you do the corn, and, and we'll trade. And so they were sharing and, and having economic prosperity because they were staying together and working together. This was putting another, more, even more financial burden on the Missourians. Well, they were also afraid that the members of the church were going to be voting and moving politically as a block. Two other things that they disagreed on, slavery was a big time issue here in America. The saints did not like slavery. They were anti. The Missourians, they were kind of, well, we don't know. But deep down, they were pro-slavery. The other thing, they had just, op just as much opposite opinions about the Native Americans. Where the members of the church were preaching, the Native Americans are sons and daughters of God. The Missourians were saying, no, they're heathens. And so they had a lot of disagreement here. Well, push came to shove. The Missourians said, we don't like what's going on and we're afraid of what might go on. And so we're just going to get rid of these guys. So through physical persecution, they drove the saints out of Jackson County, a, the county which Independence is a city within that county. Now, if you look at a count, a count uh, excuse me, if you look at the map of Missouri and it, and it happens to be a map of the counties, you can follow along with me here. Jackson County is down in the uh, southwest corner of the state. They pushed them out of Jackson County across the Missouri River into Clay County going north now. They're in Clay County. The citizens of Clay County said, we don't mind so much that you're here, but uh, we want to make sure that this is temporary. We don't want you to stay too long. The members of the church said, well, how long is too long? They said, in about two years, why don't you get on your way? 
So the saints set up towns, they set up uh, homes and shops, and, and uh, they had livestock, they had businesses, they had farms, and they were doing well, and things were great. But those two years came, uh, came up, and the Missourians in Clay County said, hey, you've been here two years, and remember this wasn't going to be a permanent thing? And the saints said, well, we're American citizens, you know, remember that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness thing? Well, that's us, that's you. We don't have a problem with you. You shouldn't have a problem with us. We're free Americans. We have every right as anybody. And the citizens of Clay County said, well, we understand that thing. So in order to make it fair, let's put it to a vote. So they put it on the ballot. Should the, should the members of the church get on their way or should we let them stay here? Well, the citizens of Clay County voted that, yeah, they should get on their way. So without persecution, they knew they had to go. But where do they go? They didn't know. They had a friend who was not a member of the church by the name of Alexander Donovan. He was now serving in the state assembly, uh, working as, as a politician in the, um, at the Missouri state level. And he proposed to the, to, the, uh, um, to the state government that they take Ray County. Ray County, which is just to the east of Clay County, but extended skinny and all the way north to the Iowa border, uh, was one county, Ray County. Alexander Donovan proposed to the politicians, what if we take Ray County, divide it into three pieces, Ray in the south, Davies at the, in the north, and Caldwell County in the middle. And Caldwell County is a place where the saints can call home. The state assembly said, great idea. This could solve a lot of problems. We'll put everybody into the new, newly created Caldwell County. The problem was that wasn't good enough. It couldn't go into law until they get one more signature. They needed the governor's signature. The governor at this time, Governor Boggs. Governor Boggs, and remember that name, and you know that name, but Governor Boggs signed into law a place, a safe haven for the members of the church. How ironic. So the members of the church go into Caldwell County. They establish a city, the county seat. Uh, they named it Far West. Uh, at this time, we've now got all of our Missouri saints into Far West. Joseph, on the other hand, after all these wonderful spiritual manifestations that they've been experiencing, while the Missouri saints have been experiencing persecution, those manifestations and spiritual experiences are starting to wind down as the persecution in Kirtland is starting to wind up. So the saints in Kirtland now are getting, getting persecuted and pushed out of town. Where do they go? Caldwell County. Now we've got the Missouri Saints and the Kirtland Saints. They've come together in far west Missouri in Caldwell County there. Now some wonderful things happen in Caldwell County. They dedicate a spot for a temple. Four cornerstones were laid. You can still visit those four cornerstones today. The um, revelations which are contained in the Doctrine and Covenants were received in far west. Most notably, the Law of Tithing and what we love so much now uh, in today's church, thanks to President Nelson's reminder, is that it was there in far west that the Lord said, this is the name of my church. For now on, we're going to call it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, the persecution didn't stop, unfortunately, even though they were in Caldwell County. The Missouri militia was formed uh, to protect the interests of Missouri. The, what they called the Mormon militia was formed legally in order to um, provide safety and security to, uh, to the interests of the members of the church. Well, these two militias, so many things were happening, but to sum it up in, in these two minutes or whatever, uh, these two militias were facing off. They had a couple miles between them, but they were looking at each other and kind of kind of staring each other down and posturing one with another until some members of the Missouri militia snuck into the camp of the Mormon militia, kidnapped three men, and took off south with them. They go to Joseph. Joseph, what do we do? They kidnap three of our men. Joseph says, go get them. You know, it's, of course, it's within our legal right that you can't be kidnapped. And so the Missouri militia takes off south. The Mormon militia takes off after them. They get to either side or opposite sides of Crooked River. And this is where the famous Battle of Crooked River takes place. The next mor they're both camped on either side of the river. The next morning, the sun's coming up, and the members of the church, or the Mormon militia, I should, I should say, uh, had, was on the wrong side of the bank because the sun came up and revealed their hiding place while the Missourians were still in the shadows. Well, the Missourians uh, shot once, killing David Patton, a member of the Mormon militia and the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. They shoot him dead. 
the, the Mormon militia returns fire. A few shots were fired before everybody said, hold on, hold on, we, neither of, the, of us like this, neither side liked it, we both don't want a part of this, they both retreated away. Unfortunately, with those few gunshots, not only David Patton, but a couple of others of the Mormon militia uh, were killed in that, in that gunfire. Well, the leader of the Missouri militia sends a letter to Governor Boggs. The Mormons attacked us and wiped out our militia completely. Now, based on what I just told you, you know that's not true, but that's what happened. The leader of the Missouri militia, a man by the name of Samuel Lucas, the leader of the Mormon militia, a man by the, by the name of George Hinkle, they happened to know each other. They had served together in the U.S. Army before. So George Hinkle says to Joseph, let me go talk to Samuel and let me see if I can work out a peace treaty. Well, I got ahead of myself just slightly. Before this peace treaty was happening, while the Battle of Crooked River was still going on and skirmishes and people were running all over chasing each other and the, and the boys who were kidnapped who were recovered and brought back to Far West, while this was all going on, there was another unfortunate battle happening as well before Hinkle and Lucas were going to try to work out a peace treaty, and that was Hans Mill. Now you've heard of Hans Mill, of course, but this is where Hans Mill comes into play. The Missourians get a little fearful unjustly and, and not for any good reason, they get a little fearful that the members of the church, because they're becoming so populous, there's so many in number, that they might take over the, the state. A lot of rumors were flying around, a lot of fear. That fear drove 250 men to get on horseback, arm themselves, painted their faces black so they couldn't be identified, and they go into the sleepy settlement of Hans Mill, a few miles out, uh, outside of Far West. Now, why were they going into Hans Mill to, uh, to approach the members of the church there? Because they were members of the church. The people in Hans Mill were not in Kirtland. They weren't in Jackson County. They didn't do anything with Battle of Crooked River or anything like that. The Missourians had no business harassing these members of the church, except for the justification which the Missourians had in that the people in Hans Mill were members of the church. So because they had a testimony that the Book of Mormon was true and that Joseph Smith was a prophet, the people in Hans Mill were harassed and 17 of them were murdered this afternoon, that afternoon. We refer to it as the Hans Mill Massacre, but based on the facts that I just told you, I think it's more appropriate to refer to it as the Hans Mill Martyrdom. For those people died because of the things they believed in it to be true. Well, 17 men and boys were killed at Hans Mill before the 250 men left. Everybody else went into hiding to save and protect themselves. A few days later, they would come out of hiding. They would take those 17 men and boys and they would bury them in a common grave. There was a woman by the name of Amanda Smith who lost her husband and one of her sons that day. The other son who did survive, even though he was shot, was, was wounded severely, so much so that he, she and he could not go with the other saints into the safety and protection confines of Far West. They stayed there in Hans Mill. Well, they're out there by themselves. Her son is, is wounded severely. She's scared. Um, she goes into the cornfield one afternoon and she prays and she expresses the, the pain and agony she's going through, the fear that she has. She just buried a husband and a son. She's trying to get to Far West. Her son's injured, um, and so her heart's broken. She reminds the Lord of this, and the Lord uh, says to her, as recorded in her journal, that soul, on, uh, that soul who on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I cannot desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Amanda Smith said with those words, she took courage. She nursed her son back to health in miraculous ways. They joined the saints in Far West. They would travel with the saints to Nauvoo, and eventually she made it all the way to the Salt Lake Valley, where she died firm in the faith. Not far from Hans Mill is a present-day city by the name of Breckenridge, Breckenridge, Missouri. I've been there, and in the town square, if you can call it that, it can't be more a, a, a city more of than 100 people. It is a, is a large granite monument. I don't know who put it there. I don't know if the church did or just the local citizens, but somebody has put this big, beautiful uh, monument 
up there, reminding anybody who comes by of what occurred at Hans Mill. On one side of this monument, they list the 17 names of those who lost their lives that day. On the other side are listed the, wid the names of the widows or the women who lost sons that day. Amanda Smith's name is there. At the bottom of, of the list of all these women is inscribed, this monument is dedicated to these women who never lost the faith. And if you track the history of all those women, you'll find that every single one of them never lost the faith, despite the horrific tragedy they, must, they did suffer. We have Hans Mill now happening. At that, at, within days, Hans Mill and the Battle of Crooked River occur. Joseph Smith says, we've got to find a way to peace. We've tried the legal systems. We've tried to defend ourselves legally. And he says to George Hinkle, yes, if you can make a deal with George, Samuel Lucas, by all means, let's make it happen. George Hinkle goes and meets with Samuel Lucas. He comes back to Joseph and he says, Joseph, I've got a peace treaty. Here's the deal. We've just got to turn in your guns. Come down and sign, the, turn in your guns. You've got to come down and sign the peace treaty after doing so. Joseph says, we have no other choice. With Charles C. Rich carrying the white surrender flag, Joseph and many others go down and into the camp of the Missouri militia. As soon as they arrive there, George Hinkle says to Samuel Lucas, General, here are the prisoners as I promised. With that, the, more, the Missouri militia surrounded Joseph and the other brethren and they arrested them. They had threatened to hang them in far west the next day. Luckily, the friend of the saints, as Alexander Donovan, a character I've already referred to in this history, he was there and he told Samuel Lucas, this is illegal, I won't stand for it, and this won't happen. Samuel Lucas agreed, whether he wanted to or not, uh, he, he didn't hang the prophet in Hiram, but instead he arrested them and took them to Richmond where they would be held until their trial. Eventually they ended up in Liberty Jail. They're there in Liberty Jail through one of the coldest, most miserable winters recorded in Missouri history. They're in a dungeon below ground and it's freezing cold. The conditions uh, cannot be expressed, cannot be explained other than absolute horrific situation that they were in for four months. And under such conditions that they were physically in, Joseph's thoughts were not only on his family, but also on all the saints uh, that were members of the church. Here they had been harassed for, for years in Missouri. Now the extermination order had been signed by Governor Boggs. Giving uh, the, the extermination order said that the members of the church must be driven from the state or exterminated. They've now got that going against them. They've now got very angry mobs that are harassing the citizens there in far west all, always, continually. Joseph's mind is with them, their safety, their security. What do we do? He prays to the Lord these words, O God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covers thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed in thine eye? Yea, thy pure eye behold from the eternal heavens the wrongs of thy people and of thy servants, and thine ear be penetrated with their cries. Yea, O Lord, how long shall they suffer these wrongs and unlawful oppressions? Before thine heart shall be softened toward them, and thy bowels be moved with compassion toward them. Remember thy suffering saints, O our God, and thy servants will rejoice in thy name forever. And the answer that comes, my, pe my son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. The Lord, as always, made good on his promise. There would be a safe haven for the saints. They would be cared for and taken and, and cared take, cared for in in uh, in a wonderful uh, way. Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball, members of the Quorum of the Twelve, would be charged in leading the Exodus eastward, out of far west. They would cross 300 miles across the frozen prairies of Missouri. Where were they going? They didn't know. Because of the extermination order, they just knew they had to get out of town and out of the state. They headed east, knowing that they needed to get across the Mississippi River and into Illinois. 
Well, they get to the the um, the border there on the Mississippi River, and it's winter time. There's big chunks of ice floating down the Mississippi River, and they can't get across. They uh, they set up camp as best they can. They had to run out of town, leaving behind all of their possessions, any provisions that would have been helpful in in a wintertime encampment. Uh, they had to they had to just leave and go because they were they were on the run. They get to the banks of the river, and the citizens on the of Quincy, Illinois, on the other side of the Mississippi River, start to take notice of these five thousand or so people who are now camped on the other side of the river and they look over and in their journals they talk about the pitiful situation they see crying children who can't be comforted by their mothers men who are trying to put up a tattered and and uh, blankets that are full of holes to provide a little bit of shelter wood that won't burn because it's too wet and even if they could get it to burn there was no food to cook on it anyway the citizens of Quincy who are not members of the church decided that something had to be done. The mayor calls out, bring your provisions, bring blankets, food, firewood, everything that we can do to help these poor people. And the citizens of Quincy did. They brought in all those provisions. They piled it high on the banks of the Mississippi River. And then the mayor says, bring boats. We've got to have rowboats and canoes to take these goods over to those people. Boats were brought. And then the mayor calls out a third plea. Uh, or or th for a third uh, call of direction. Now we need somebody to get in these boats and take the goods over to those good to those poor people. No one responded. It was a suicide mission. Load up a canoe with all these provisions and try to get across the Mississippi River that's full of floating ice. Not just floating ice, but float the but ice that is flying down the river. If it hits the boat, it's going to capsize it, and whoever the captain is of that rowboat is going to drown and die. No one responds. He calls out again, somebody come, these people need our help, nothing. A third call finally brings a response from a young man. A young man says, I'll do it. So he gets in a rowboat, they pile in as many provisions as they can, and he rows as quickly as he can across the Mississippi River. He does so with more courage than I could ever muster in such a situation or any kind of situation, but he makes it. And the citizens in Quincy get so excited that he safely crossed all the way to the Mississippi, all the way to the other side of the Mississippi River, that almost without thinking, other men jump in the rowboats and they start taking off. I don't know of any recorded incident of accident or death. I think they all made it safely to the other side. They started handing out clothing, they, shelter, food, dry firewood, clean water, blankets, everything they could to take care of these wonderful people, the of saints. Well, eventually they got all the saints over to the Illinois side and people in Quincy, their work wasn't done. The people in Quincy were about t numbered in about 2,500. The number of saints, about 5,000. People in Quincy were greatly outnumbered, but they brought them into their homes. They sheltered them, they fed them, they employed them, they took care of them. Eventually Joseph got out of jail, out of liberty. He was released because he had been kept on frivolous charges. They were not true. The they had all they, uh, uh, they the charges were dismissed because there was no evidence uh, backing up the bogus claims that Joseph and Hiram and the others had been guilty of anything. Well, they also made it all the way over to the Mississippi River. They crossed over and they found themselves in Quincy. It wasn't long after that that Joseph and a team of scouts headed up the bank of the Mississippi about 40 miles to a little place that was nicknamed Commerce. Maybe not even nicknamed. Maybe it was the real name, but it was a temporary name because later they would change the name from Commerce to Nauvoo. Joseph would bring all the saints up. They would clear out the water. They would build homes. They would have shops. They would have stores. They would have homes and farms, churches and they would start to build a temple. Other things were restore, uh, revealed to Joseph. Doctrinal uh, aspects of the gospel were, were provided, such as baptisms for the dead. The Relief Society was organized. Peace pervaded, uh, prevailed. Peace prevailed, and they enjoyed it. They had prosperity, economic growth. They had prosperity spiritually. Spiritual growth was, was amongst them. They were a community that was truly Zion. They had found it. They had the peace. They had the happiness. They had the Spirit of the Lord among them, and they prospered in all aspects of their life. 
they enjoyed a wonderful sense of community and a, a, a sense of being a members of the true Church of Jesus Christ for many years. Unfortunately, that wouldn't last for long. Uh, uh, the mobs would come back, the mobs would harass. The mobs drove uh, their uh, frivolous charges again against the Prophet Joseph to where he was incarcerated unjustly in Carthage. And without going into all the great details that are contained in, in the situation of how Joseph got to Carthage, under what charges um, he was there on it, but ultimately how those charges were dismissed, how he was promised the protection of the governor, Governor Thomas Ford, that uh, he would be safe while there in the jail until he himself would personally escort Joseph and Hiram back to Nauvoo. All of those things were for naught, though. Um, President Oaks, many, many years ago, uh, wrote a book called The Carthage Conspiracy. And simply the title of the book is sufficient for this recording to explain that the, there was a conspiracy against, pro, against the prophet and his brother Hiram that uh, they would not get out of Carthage alive. And that's true. On June 27th, 1844, at 517 in the afternoon, an angry mob stormed the stairs of the Carthage jail. The jailer, knowing that Joseph and Hiram were innocent and were of no danger, they, uh, he sent them to the upstairs bedroom, his own bedroom, where they would be more safe and more comfortable. They were living in the, in the uh, upstairs bedroom when that angry mob stormed up the stairs, pushed their way through the door, and opened fire. Hiram was the first to die taking a bullet to the face. While falling backwards onto the floor, he called out, I am a dead man. Joseph, looking at his brother, kneeling beside him, cradling his head in his arms, he says, my dear brother Hiram. Perhaps for the safety of John Taylor and Willard Richards, who were in the room, Joseph proceeded towards the window where he leaped from that second story window. He was mortally wounded. He fell uh, out the window and he was dead. Joseph and Hiram, their bodies would be collected and taken back to Nauvoo where there would be a public viewing. In that viewing, Hiram's uh, widow, many things happened, but uh, one story I, I want to share, Hiram's widow, Mary Fielding Smith, uh, along with their son, Joseph F. Smith, future president of the church, came to the public viewing. The two of them, hand in hand, came into the mansion house where the viewing was taking place, the mansion house being the nickname of where Joseph and Emma and their children lived. The bodies were there in the parlor room. First, Mary Fielding Smith and Joseph F. Smith paid their respects to Joseph Smith the prophet. Next, they went to Hiram, beloved Hiram, the husband of Mary Fielding and the father of Joseph F. Smith. Mary Fielding picks up Joseph F. Smith so that he can peer into the casket, see his, the lifeless body of his father, and while studying his father's face for one last time, Mary Fielding whispers in Joseph's ear, Joseph, your father died for the truth. Make sure you always live for the truth. What a great reminder for all of us Latter-day Saints to do the same. It's one thing to die for the truth, but I wonder if it's more difficult, especially in today's day and age, to live for the truth than it would be to die for it. What a charge to live for the truth and all the things that those that, that, would, that would mean and entail. After the funeral, as things would continue to proceed, the mobs thought that with, jo with Joseph's death would come the death of the church. Of course, not so. Brigham Young, as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, would lead with the Quorum of the Twelve, the church at this point. Uh, three months, two months before Joseph passed away in March 1844, Joseph brings the Quorum of the Twelve together and he teaches them, he preaches to them. Wilford Woodruff records this and I'll, I'll uh, give you his quote here in a moment. And the reason I do is because oftentimes we think that when Joseph died, there was confusion. Joseph and the court, or excuse me, hi, not even higher. Brigham and the Quorum of the Twelve were now leading the church. Uh, and it's often said that there was confusion. Should they be the leaders? Should it be Sidney Rigdon? What about Lyman Johnson, who also wanted to be a leader of the church? There was a few other people that wanted to be the church and thought that they had claim on it. And so the citizens of Nauvoo and the members of the church 
They were confused as to what to do and who to follow. Not the case. No, that wasn't. That's not true. There were some men who want who had a lot of pride and wanted a lot of power, and they wanted to lead the church, and they thought they could do things their way instead of the Lord's way. And a few people followed after them. They were deceived by by those people, by those men, and so a few of them fell away. But the majority of the saints, there was no confusion at all. That's because, as I alluded to just a moment ago, a meeting was held, several meetings actually, in March of 1844. These notes were brought to us from Wilford Woodruff, speaking and I'm quoting from him. Joseph Smith spent the last winter of his life, some three or four months, with the Quorum of the Twelve teaching them. It was not merely a few hours ministering to them, the ordinances of the gospel, but he spent day after day, week after week, and month after month teaching them, and a few others, the things of the kingdom of God. I remember the last speech that Joseph Smith ever gave to us before his death. He, sp st he stood upon his feet some three hours. The room was filled as with consuming fire. His face was as clear as amber, and he was clothed upon by the power of God. He laid before us our duty. He laid before us the fullness of the great work of God, and in his remarks to us he said, I have sealed upon my head, I have had sealed upon my head every key, every power, every principle of life and salvation that God has ever given to any man who ever lived upon the face of the earth. And these principles and this priesthood and power belong to this great and last dispensation, which the God of heaven has set his hand to establish in the earth. Now, I have sealed upon your heads every key, every power, and every principle which the Lord had sealed upon my head. And continuing, he said, I have lived so long, up to the present time. I have been in the midst of, these, of this people, and in the great work and labor of redemption. I have desired to see this temple built, but I shall never live to see it completed. But you will. I roll the burden and responsibility of leading this church off from my shoulders onto yours. Now, round up your shoulders and stand under it like men, for the Lord is going to let me rest for a while. Was there confusion in Nauvoo as to who should lead the church? No, because Brigham and the other members of the Quorum of the Twelve had the keys of the priesthood, those very same keys that had been bestowed upon Joseph and Oliver in the Kirtland Temple several years prior. With that leadership in place and with the saints ready and willing to follow, the exodus out of Nauvoo towards Salt Lake started February 4th, 1846. Prior to the exodus, they decided that they would complete the Nauvoo Temple. They, they completed the Nauvoo Temple, and before they left town, about 5,600 people had received their temple blessings in Nauvoo. I'll give you a quote here. As the pressure to leave Nauvoo increased from the mobs, the mobs pushing them out, as the, as the pressure to leave Nauvoo increased, President Young addressed the saints on the 3rd of February, 1846. Remember the dates? This is one day prior to starting their journey west, one day before the Exodus. Brigham speaking to them. The plan was to leave the next day, which they did, but the saints still filled the temple. President Young urged the saints to return to their homes and prepare for their departure. In his history, President Young records, Notwithstanding, I had announced that we would not attend to the administration of the ordinances. The house of the Lord was thronged all day, the anxiety being so great to receive. I informed the brethren that I was going to get my wagon and start, to, and start off. I walked some distance from the temple, supposing the crowd would disperse. But on returning, I found the house filled to overflowing. Looking upon the multitude and knowing their anxiety, as they were thirsting and hungering for the word, we continued at work diligently in the house of the Lord. 295 persons received their ordinances. And then they would start the trek west the very next day. Brothers and sisters, that's the first vision to Carthage Gel with a little bit more. I'll leave you with a tribute to the prophet from the John Taylor. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world, more than any man who has ever lived in it. In the short space of 20 years, he has brought forth the Book of Mormon, which he translated by the gift and power of God, and he has been the means of publishing it on two continents. He set the fullness of the everlasting gospel. 
which it contained to the four quarters of the earth has brought forth the revelation and commandments which compose this book of Doctrine and Covenants and many other wise documents and instructions for the benefit of the children of men, gathered many thousands of saints, founded a great city, and left a fame and name that cannot be slain. He lived great, and he died great in the eyes of God and his people, and like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, has sealed his mission and his work with his own blood. And so has his brother Hiram. In life they were not divided, and in death they were not separated." Joseph went to Carthage to deliver himself up to the pretended requirements of the law. Two or three days previous to his assassination, he said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm and as a summer's morning. I have a conscious void of offense toward God and towards all men. I shall die innocent, and it shall be said of me, he was murdered in cold blood. And finally, Joseph's own testimony to conclude here. I had actually seen a light. And in the midst of that light, I saw two personages, and they did in reality speak to me. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. And while they were persecuting me, reviling me, and speaking all manner of evil against me falsely for me so saying, I was led to say in my heart, Why persecute me for telling the truth? I have actually seen a vision. And who am I that I can withstand God? Or why does the world think to make me deny what I have actually seen? For I had seen a vision. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. Brothers and sisters, I know he saw a vision. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And through him, Jesus Christ restored his gospel in its fullness, which we enjoy as Latter-day Saints today. And I say all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.